Okay. <clears throat> well, just you probably already know a little background on me, but um, I'm a uh, father of four, four beautiful daughters, and I've been married to my wife Sandy for 22 years. Um, I'm a practicing attorney, CPA. Um, I've been in private practice for 28 years. Um, born and bred, Illinois, Illinois boy. Um, I grew up in Joliet, Illinois. Um, attended the University of Illinois in Champaign. Graduated with my accounting degree in 1982. Um, stayed in Champaign and worked for a year as an accountant before I moved all the way back up to Chicago and attended law school at DePaul University. And I graduated from DePaul in 1986 with my law degree. Um, being an accountant, CPA, attorney, I was recruited by, at that point in time, the big eight accounting firms. Um, and I, I took a job out of law school with Arthur Anderson in their Chicago tax office. Was in that office for slightly over four years where I left as a tax manager um, to start my own practice. Um, my partner is a colleague of mine from Arthur Anderson. We had worked together at Arthur Anderson. And I was in private practice for one year before he joined me and we formed Webster and Shelley uh, law firm in 1991. Um, I'm not a politician by any stretch of the imagination. I, uh, my background in politics is that I've been elected to my local school board three times. Um, I'm the, currently the school board president of Cass School District 63 in Darien, Illinois. Cass School District is an elementary school district of about 850 children. Um, we have two buildings, uh, an elementary school and a junior high. I was elected to the board in 2005 because there were some financial issues in our school district. And I was involved because that was the district my kids went to school at the time. I was involved in a foundation that the school district had put together. I was one of the founding members. And <clears throat> they, had, they had used me as, as, an, as a resource being, since they had an attorney CPA as one of the kids' parents. They, they wrestled me into helping them start the foundation. And then when some issues came up on the actual school board, that some financial issues and some concerns, um, they encouraged me to consider running for that school board, which I did. I was immediately um, elected vice president of that school board after being elected. And two years later, I became the president of the school board and have been ever since. Um, my law practice is limited to the business law area. I'm not a criminal lawyer, personal injury, divorce, family law. I'm a you know, really concentrate in the financial law areas, being a CPA attorney. Um, my have a heavy emphasis in tax and taxation. Um, most of my clientele are owner operators of their own businesses, entrepreneurial type clients, and uh, high net worth professionals. I do quite a bit of work in the trust and estates area. So that's, that's the background of, of what I do financially. My daughter's one's in college at the University of South Carolina. She's in her third year. She's a pharmacy student. I have a senior in high school, and then I have identical twins that are juniors in high school, and they attend Hinsdale South High School, which is in my backyard. What's tougher, running for school board or for statewide <clears throat> office? Um, probably running for school board, because running for statewide office, people kind of like you. When you run for your school board, you see them at the deli counter at the grocery <laughs> store, and uh, everybody's got a complaint about the schools, it appears. Um, the one, the one difference because of the size of my school district, when I did run for school board, it was a contested election, my first election in 2005. <clears throat> I was able to knock on every door in the school district and shake everybody's hand and yeah, introduce Saturday, myself. Right? Pardon me? Just on Saturday. <laughs> yeah, it took, yeah a couple, in a couple of weeks. Um, running statewide's been a little bit different. Um, I've probably put 25,000 miles on my car in the last uh, 13 months. And uh, you know I've seen places in Illinois where I thought, Thought I had been before, but I hadn't. So it's been it's been quite quite an enlightening experience. Your background seems to run to other statewide offices. Why did you choose Secretary of State? Actually, I think my background lends well to all of the, all of the executive offices in in, the, in Illinois. So when when my my time came up in my mind, as I said, I'm not a politician at all, um, but I've I've helped. I've assisted candidates. And I've, I've tried to work more on my local level. And I kind of took the situation of the state of Illinois, and I was looking at it about, you know, in the last couple of years and said, I really want to step up and I want to help. 
there's something I could do. Who, who, who could I help? Which candidates need my help? I want to get some elected some people that I think could really turn some things around in Illinois. And I work in the business area with my clients every day, and I touch the Secretary of State's office just about every day with my owner-operator clients in the business services end. Not so much in the driver's facilities, but I'm, I'm using the Secretary of State's office, so I'm intimately familiar with that office. I, I think I would be an ideal candidate for a state treasurer or a comptroller as well because of my accounting background and as much time as I spend in the accounting world. I did look into look, running for attorney general because there was a, a time someone asked me a year ago would I consider, if I was considering looking at a statewide office, would I consider the attorney general's race? And at that point in time, the current attorney general was considering running for governor and there were several uh, candidates think you know potential candidates lining up to look for you know to run for attorney general if it was going to be an open seat when mrs matt madigan indicated she was going to seek re-election then there weren't any candidates and that's when i was approached to say would you consider that i said i would consider it but actually i've never been a prosecutor that's not the kind of law i've practiced although i have the law degree and the attorney general should be an attorney um really i'm more of the, on the business side so i thought the business offices were were where I would look in the comptroller's office or the treasurer's office and personally because of my experience on a day-to-day -day practical level with the secretary of state's office that was actually an office that I felt like I was you know ideal an ideal candidate um, for that position what do you see are the, the shortcomings of the office right now where, where does it well there's there's a lot of areas and um, you know as, as I said the driver services is an area that everybody in the state and as I've campaigned around the state there's when I explain to people the different departments in the Secretary of State's office they go really I thought it was just about driver's license and license plates and roads and it's really not there's there's a big need in this in in the driver services area for improvement I've we, we've all experienced the Department of Motor Vehicles and you know, purchasing our license plates or renewing our license, and and the frustration level. People will tell me, well, this office is great and this office is not good, and th there's really no consistency in in the in the customer service in the office. I've I've had people say, well, we don't go to this office. We drive 50 miles to go to this office because we can get it done, and you know, I'd rather spend the time in the car than spend the time waiting in line. There's there, there's a there's a need for the customer service in the Department of Motor Vehicles that that could be greatly enhanced. I've looked around to our neighboring states and states around the country, and how they're handling these offices. There's less and less personal interaction that you really physically need to go to these offices to handle your driver services. That we seem to be in Illinois, requiring everybody to still still come into the office and make make that that pilgrimage every four years or every year for their, their car license plates. There has been some automation to it, um, but, but, it's, but it's, still, it's still far behind. There's other states that have, for example, and I've suggested this, there's, there, they have kiosks where you can do some of the, the mundane, more mundane services at locations not just at the Secretary of State's office. They're in airports, they're in, you know, community centers, they're in the downtowns, they're in some city halls that would make that um, that task much easier for people. You know, I'm spoiled living in the suburban Chicago area. I mean, I have the choice of about six different driver's facilities to go to, depending on if I'm in my office, if I'm at home, if I'm visiting my, my sister, you know, we have, we have plenty. But when you move away from, you know, suburban, you know, Chicago, you know, those, those departments can be, you know, far away to get to. We can make, we can make that office much more user friendly. And we can do it through the internet as well. A lot of states have created part of the office as a, really a virtual Secretary of State's office, which I believe we have a need to do here in Illinois. And, and we're, we're behind. We're, we're way behind the times of what other, other states are doing. We're not going to create, recreate the wheel, but we could at least catch up. Is that a play also to some of the business? Well, that's where I was going to go next because that's the area where I have my expertise of the outsider using the department way more than you know, the, probably the driver services. Incorporating a business, 
annual reports of the business, what we need to do. The Secretary of State's the gatekeeper of all new businesses in Illinois, whether you're creating a, a business entity or you're a, a foreign, non-Illinois company registering to do business. You have to come through the Secretary of State's office. It's a bureaucratic nightmare for some clients. Most of my clients are owner operators of their own business and they have to interact with the Secretary of State's office. It's been a great career for me for the last 28 years because my clients want to, if they're a restaurant, they want to serve food. If they're a construction company, they want to build homes. They don't want to deal with the bureaucracy of the Secretary of State's office in the state of Illinois. So what they do is they hire me and I deal with it and then they have to pay a fee to me. That's not the right way for businesses to do it. Um, we, we, can, we can simplify that process as well. And I have, we've got a lot of areas that we, we will address you know, from the beginning. And also just from getting started. CEO Magazine this summer put out their, their rankings of the, the friendliest and you know, states of incorporating businesses and starting a new business. Illinois was third from the bottom. Only New York and California were worse than Illinois. From cost, timing, and, and the red tape that a, a new business has to go through. A lot of that's legislatively created, but we need a Secretary of State who's going to use that office to, to help businesses. When Governor Edgar, at the time was Secretary of State Edgar, he had an advisory panel of business and community leaders that proposed over 500 pieces of legislation to help the business community and take that to the legislator to get things passed. You know, the current secretary disbanded that group in 2005. I was, that would be one of the first things I would get back. Let's get the business community there. I feel like I would be that advocate from the beginning because that's who I am right now. I've tried to propose legislation through my congressman, you know, my state representatives, just as a practicing attorney. I think we need a secretary of state who's going to be an advocate for those job creators and let's do something in the business services area. And, and from an automation standpoint, with, I said we're behind in the driver services. We're woeful in the in the business services. If you want to create an, a new corporation in Illinois, you've got two options, two avenues you can do. And this is what I do every day. You can either download a form, print it up, mail it in duplicate with a check to the Secretary of State's office in Springfield, no matter where you are in Illinois. The Secretary of State's office will open that envelope. Somebody will process the check. Somebody will take the piece of paper that you filled out and put it into the computer system. If it gets approved in a couple weeks, it'll get mailed back to the person who incorporated, and you have your corporation. Or you can go online. You can fill in this information yourself, pay with a credit card, and within 24 hours, you can have your articles of incorporation back. That really seems like the way the system should be done. But if you want to do it that way, there's a 62% premium in cost to do it, do it in the automated system where we, we've eliminated, I don't know how many hands touching that file, you know, and the potential of input errors and, and other errors. And I, I think we should be working in the direction of, let's make this an easier system for someone who wants to start a new business. Let's, let's give them a financial incentive to do it in a way that I don't need 10 people touching that piece of paper and that file. And let's expedite it for that business owner without, without charging them a premium. My clients tell me, well, Mike, you know, a lot of times they come to me at the last minute and say, we need, to, we need to start a new business because we've been doing this for the last four months and we're ready to go. And I just went to the bank and they said, I need my articles of incorporation before I can have my you know, I can get the loan to get rolling, and the landlord needs it before I can sign the lease. And I say, well, if we mail it in, that's going to be about a two-week process, and it's going to cost this amount. Or I can do it expedited and, you know, do it online, and we can get it all done for you, but it's going to cost you a lot more. <clears throat> and they're saying, why are they doing that to me? You know, why is the state doing this to me? I'm just trying to start a business. All I want to do is get back to work. You know, I really don't want to go through this nightmare. Those are the areas that we need to improve. What, what are the cost differences? Well, it's a... It's a $175 to just do it on paper. It's $282.50 to do it online. So there's a, it's a 62% cost premium to do that. The annual report, if you do it by paper, it's about, you know, a minimum charge is $100. To do it online, I think it's $164. You know, there's, it's annually. I mean, it's, it's just, it, it seems ridiculous to me that we're charging a premium to do it the more efficient way. And those, those are some of the changes. Those are little changes that will make a big difference 
in, in businesses' lives. And I have clients who just tell me, you know, Mike, I don't want you to file my annual report. I figured out how to do it online. I know it costs me a little bit more, but I can get it done in a few minutes. I'm just going to do it, but this doesn't seem right to me. You know, and, and they'll do it that way. And, you know, we encourage them, you know, you, you do what you have to do. But it's not a business-friendly environment here in Illinois for these entrepreneurs and job creators. And the, the citizens who live along the borders of Indiana, Wisconsin, and Iowa, when they have the option of going across the border and doing this, they're saying, why would I do it here in Illinois? Let me, let me just do it. I mean, when we're in the heartland of Illinois, it's, maybe that's not the option. Um, but people, you know, we're, we're, we're scaring the job creators away from Illinois. We need, to, we need to bring them back into Illinois. And we need to, you know, have a Secretary of State who's going to use what I'd say the bully pulpit of that office to say, hey, this is what the business community is saying they need. This is what the people who are, you know, starting small businesses and hiring people, you know, are telling us. Why, why don't we work with them instead of putting up roadblocks and barricades for them to, you know, to, to, to struggle in Illinois to, to run their business? They want to they wanna serve that food. They want to build that house. They want to repair that car. They don't want to file paperwork with the Secretary of State's office or the Department of you know, revenue. They want they want the the process to be to be simple. Student fees are set by the legislature. They are set by the legislator, but but you know, Secretary White has been a proponent of you know this is where we can this is where we can raise the revenue and we can bring money in. I mean, he just he was just vocal um, this summer stating that if the the temporary income tax is not made permanent, he's going to have to do one of two things. He's going to have to either lay off people or increase fees. Go to the legislature and increase fees. You know, so we don't have an advocate in the office for businesses right now. We have, we have, you know, a career politician who is bringing in more revenue. You know, working on the revenue side of, you know, I've, I've said it. I, I didn't, I didn't make this quote, but Illinois doesn't have a revenue problem. We've, we're bringing in more revenue in this state than we ever have. We've got a spending problem. So. We don't need to figure out ways to increase fees and increase revenues. I mean, I've, I've been public to saying, you know, our neighboring states, to create a limited liability company in Illinois, the filing fee is $500. Next door, it's $39. Just Indiana, to the filing fee. There's some legislation that's being proposed in the Senate right now to actually re reduce that fee. I actually think it's in the House as well, I think. Um, Representative Sandak of Downers Grove is, is kind of leading that one. You know, let's, let's help these small businesses. I'm all for that. I mean, there should not be such a burden and such a, a cost to, to want to start a business in Illinois. I think we should, you know, cover the administrative costs if that's what we're trying to do. But let's welcome new businesses to Illinois. Let's not put a barrier up right at the beginning. And then, you know, and then an annual barrier. You know, it's $250 a year to keep your limited liability company in good standing in Illinois if you, if you file it by paper and mail in a check. If you want to do it by electronically, it costs you even more. So do you think there's a spending problem in the Secretary of State's office? I do. Okay. And where, would, where do you see potential realignments or cuts? Well, we, of the 22 departments in the Secretary of State's office, they employ over 4,000 individuals, 4,000 people, and with a payroll in excess of $200 million. Next to the governor's office, the Secretary of State is a larger employer in state government, in, in our state government. We have some, some employment issues that we need to address. I mean, the current secretary, after he was reelected in 2010, the first thing he did was institute pay raises for 250 exempt employees at, of up to 6%. The, the, the numbers came out, at set, it was about $78,000 a month to the taxpayers, just those pay raises, at the same time when the unions were suing Governor Quinn for trying to roll back pay increases, where there were furloughs being taken by other departments in the state, where there were, you know, salary freezes, but these executive offices under the Secretary of State were receiving pay raises. I think we need a top-to-bottom review of, of who's working in that Secretary of State's office, who are these 4,000 employees, and what jobs are they doing at this point in time. And then we need to take a look at some of the departments in the Secretary of State's office. You know, the Secretary of State's the state librarian. 
you know, where, how is this grant money being distributed around the state? As a school board president, I know my school district, we got a, we got a library grant from the Secretary of State's office. It was $250. Now, as a school board president, I love a dollar that comes in anywhere into our school district. But the, probably the administrative cost of giving my school district $250 probably would far exceeded the, the benefit. And that $250 came from somewhere else in the state into Springfield to be turned around to give them back to the community. I think we need to realign where the, where the money's coming from, where it's, what we're spending the money on. I think, and, and we need to have that drill down audit in every department. I mean, I'm an accountant by education. I look at the numbers and say, you know, if, if any business, any one of my clients' business is not succeeding. They're spending more money than they have. You can't sustain that for very long. The state of Illinois is doing that. You know, my message is a tough message that I've told people on the campaign trail. I'm going to tell it how it is. You know, it's, sometimes you don't want to hear it, but the truth is the truth. You can't spend more money than you have for too long or you're going to get in trouble. You know, we, my, my wife and my four daughters, they try to do that in my house, spend more money than we have. And it's not, it doesn't work. So occasionally I've got to, I've got to make the hard line decision and say this is where it's got to stop. I've had to do it in my business. I have to do it for my clients. I have to do it at home. Somebody's got to do it in Illinois. Uh, in terms of driver's license facilities, do you have the right number in Illinois? Or I think we need to reallocate those resources. I mean, there's 120 some facilities or, you know, scattered around the state. Um, I just spent some time with some people in Champaign when their facility has just been closed for a week and a half because of some, you know, air problem. The facility is antiquated and outdated. I mean, this is coming from the people that work in the office, the people in that community. I had never been to that facility before, so I had no experience, you know, one-on-one -on -one with it. But I think we need, I think we need to analyze it. I've talked to people in, in you know, downstate Illinois that say the facility is, you know, 40 or 50 miles from our home that we have to go to to get to the facility. Um, I, it was a 70-year-old woman told me I have to take a driver's test to get my license renewed at this point in time. I haven't taken a driver's test since I was 16. I never drive in the city, but now I had to go to the city to take the test, and I'm scared to death to drive on the city roads. I only drive in my rural area. Um, <clears throat> I think we need to look at the resources of, of how we have it allocated. One of the problems in the current Secretary of State's office in, in many of the departments, as I've said, is for s last 16 years, the same person's been occupying that office. And you become content with what's going on. We have a status quo in Illinois where, you know, to change things means you're uprooting some, some things, and, and it's difficult. Change is never, you know, well, not never, but it's, a lot of times it's not easy, you know, and you have to change to improve. The Secretary of State's office reminds me of my garage. When I moved into my house a little over 16 years ago, my garage was huge. And over the last 16 years, I've accumulated things in my garage that my garage isn't very big anymore. You know, there's all kinds of things that I've accumulated in, that, in my garage. And they all still work. You know, they have a function. I just haven't needed them for a long time. And instead of getting rid of them, I go, I got a little bit of room. I'll just keep this around for a while because I might need it again. You know, that garage isn't going to get big again until I sell the house to the next person and they clean out all of my junk. I think that's what we have in the Secretary of State's office right now. I think it's time for a house cleaning, and we need someone who's going to come in there and is willing to do it. Rock the boat. If we have to rock the boat, we rock the boat. I said, I will tell you how it is. I will lay it out. If my message isn't one you want to hear, I'm sorry, but we can't continue. Business as usual in Illinois is not working. So we're going to have to do something. And it's, got, it's not just the Secretary of State's office. It's not just the governor's office. It's, you know, and then it's, not just, it's not just the Springfield politicians. I mean, cities have to do it. Counties have to do it. We all have to take a hard look of where we did it. We had some tough, tough times in my school district. You know, we, we have a, a $13 million budget that we cut almost 20% because that's the only way we could do it. You know what? And they, they were hard decisions. But you know what? We're still, we're, we're a top performing school. We were able to get through it. And you know what? You, you, you accumulate stuff and you get a little 
complacent in what you have and you say, well, you know what, let's kick the can down the road. We'll let the next, we'll let the next people come in and clean up the mess. You know, the current Secretary of State's been occupying 16 years. You know what, there's a lot of things that we, we, need, to, we need to move on and we need to change it. And if it's not, if it's not me this time around, it's going to be whoever it is four years from now or eight years from now if, we're, if Illinois is still around financially. I mean, we've got some issues that we really have to address and take care of. And it's not going to be easy. And, and since I'm not a Springfield insider, I'm not beholden to anybody down here, you know, from either political party or lobbyists. I can make the hard decisions without offending my, my buddies and my cronies and the people I've been, you know, in office with you know I mean Secretary White's been in Springfield since 1998 or the next 78 when the 1998 in this office 1978 as a state representative I was graduating from high school in 1978 so I mean things have changed you know in, in, in the period of time and, and I haven't built up those relationships that I'm trying to protect at this point in time we got to come in and you know Somebody's, somebody's got to do it. I'm, I'm happy to be the guy. I love, I love the two-party system. You know, people ask me, why would you run against Jesse White? I said, just because he's popular doesn't mean he's immune from a challenge. And you know what? That's why we have it. We've got to give the people a choice. I'm the choice this time. You know, and as I said, maybe my, maybe my rhetoric's too, too tough, but you know what? It's time. It's time. You know, when I was a parent, I had to let my kids cry in the crib so they'd go back to sleep at night. And now they sleep at night. You know what? Sometimes you got to make some tough decisions. I'm ready to make them. Speaking of being a parent, I'm wondering, with four, four teenagers? Four well, 20 year old, teenagers? 20 year old and three teenagers. Uh, what have your thoughts been on the, the laws, the changes to the laws for teenagers um, driving, driving with other kids in the car, driving at certain times of the day? I love it. I think I think it's great, and and you know what, I, I read a quote. I think it was in your paper. The current secretary said, "You know what, the driver's license facilities and the roads, it's it's better than it used to be. You know, better than terrible still isn't good. So we need to we need to continue. I mean, I like the road we're going down. I like I like the graduated driver's license. I think it's great. I think the um, you know the the training that they need to do it. I mean, my my two. My twins are 16 years old, and they don't have their license yet because they don't have all 50 hours of driving that they need. I love it. You know what? And my wife doesn't want to train them. <clears throat> so it's all falling on me. And you know what? I make them drive all 50 hours, and I make them drive, you know. I, I, I took my daughter through the, the drop-off and pick-up at O'Hare Airport about two weeks ago. And she's like, what are we doing up here? I said, well, someday you're going to have to drop me off at the airport, so I want you to learn how to drive here. Then when we left there, we went into the city of Chicago and then drove back home. So I'm making them drive everywhere. I think it's a great system. You know, maybe I'm, maybe I'm the terrible dad or something, but I think this is, you know, this is what you need to do. So I, I like what we're doing. Let's, let's just finish the job, though. We, we, there's some things we need to do. I mean, texting and driving. Yeah, we should stop texting and driving. I think it's, you know, it's very dangerous. I like, the, I like the fact that we're trying to do that. But if we put these laws on the books, let's enforce them. Same with the drunk driving laws. I've said this. If, the, if we have the laws on the books, the police pull the, peop, you know, the driver over, and they've been ticketed for drunk driving, Let's, let's finish the process. Let's have a Secretary of State that says, hey, judges, let's train you. You, you can't just let them go. You can't, whoever's got the biggest checkbook can't hire the best lawyer or, or clout their way out of this ticket. You know, the Chicago paper, one of the Chicago papers just a couple of weeks ago ran a big Sunday paper, at, you know, on all these communities that are letting it go. You know, I'm not saying I'm taking credit for it, but I've been preaching this since March, when since the primary, saying these cities, I, I see it firsthand as a practicing attorney. I don't do that work, but I have clients call me all the time. Hey, my son got a, you know, had a problem. Do you know a lawyer? And, you know, so I know the people that are, you know, I know I have colleagues who've made great livings on getting people out of these kind of tickets and, you know, and pleading them down. We need to, we need to, although know, that's not the Secretary of State's enforcement, you know, but we need to, we need to finish the job. I mean, the Secretary White is saying, you know, taking a lot of credit for the aid systems in the cars. I love it, but let's let's make sure it's being enforced as well. You know, let's let's use that office. It's a very powerful office, the Secretary of State. And when people think of roads in Illinois, they immediately think of the Secretary of State. They don't think of the LaSalle County prosecutor letting the person go. They think of the Secretary of State. Let's let's rattle those cages and say, enforce these laws. Every county. You know, let's 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 get it safe. I, I put my daughters out on those roads. I let them. I hand them the car keys, and it scares me. I want I want the roads to be safe for them. Where are you on the temporary tax hike? Um, 
Are you for keeping it at five percent, dropping it back, graduating it back? Like, what do you, well, what do you say? I think the temporary tax hike should be temporary. I think we should get back to the three percent tax rate. This little experiment of, of having the two percent, you know, temporary tax increase obviously hasn't worked the way the way it was supposed to. It was supposed to pay off the bills and fix it. Eighty two percent of that temporary tax hike has gone into the pension system that we're we're still treading water. So we can create we can make it an eight percent tax hike if we don't control the spending side and get the pension system in play in, in line. You know, we're we're never we can't tax ourselves enough to to get out of the trouble Illinois is in. Well, boy, if I if I had the answer to the pension crisis, I'd be I would be running for governor, and uh, you know we we could we could have it. But but we need we need to you know steps in the process. I I believe in you know I'm not running for legislative office, but if I were, you know my position is we need we need to reform the pension system. I like the 401k style for for all new people. I think we have to freeze the initial pension. Hey, we, we made a deal with the people that are in the system. We've got to live up to that deal. I don't have to say that and preach that because that's what the Constitution of Illinois says. And I'm a lawyer by education too, so I mean, that's the law. We gotta follow that law. So the people and the promises we made, we have to live with those. And let's let's do it. But we can't keep compounding that problem. And and so so we have to do something, we have to do something fast on, on the pension system. But for back to the temporary tax hike, I, I think we need to repeal it and roll it back. I'd like to see it all go back. You know, I'm a I've been a tax attorney for, you know, tax CPA attorney for, you know, 28 years. I think all my clients pay too much taxes. You know, I've spent my whole life trying to minimize taxes for people and, and what we need to do. Um, I think we, we pay a lot of taxes in Illinois. I, I think we should get that back to where it needs to be right away. That will hurt. Um, I don't think the legislators can, legislature's going to do that. I think they'll roll it back over the next term, next four years. I could probably live with that. That's not, that wouldn't be, if I were in there voting, I would probably vote to repeal it right away back to the 3%. And then and make the hard decisions. How do you square um, advocating for letting, letting the tax rates roll back down as a school board president that relies on state money? Well, actually, my school district doesn't get very much state money. So um, we're, we're in local, you know, more than 90% of our revenue comes from local property taxes in, in the collar. I'm in, I'm in DuPage County, and we, we're funded there. Um, I, I, if, if, if they could promise me that the 2% the increase in the tax right now was going to education, and not, not the smoke and mirrors they did with the lottery that it's going to education, but it was actually additional funds were going to education, I would love that. I, I think it, it should. Um, I believe the school districts need to, to live within their means as well. I mean, I forced my school district, and when I got on the board, to do that. We had to live within our means. We went to our taxpayers. You know, referendum is the way you can raise, raise school taxes and rate referendum. We took it to our taxpayers twice in, in my tenure on the school board. Both times they said, don't. You, you have enough money to live within your means. And I think that's, I think that, that's perfect. I mean, I, let's take this 2% tax hike. You know, to a referendum to the people of the state of Illinois, and I think we were going to get the same answer. No, you can't have it. Live within your means. And I think that's what we need to do. I think the problem is it's, it's a priority cut. Nobody's Absolutely. Well, nobody. Where will we cut? And, and again, that's what I, you know, part of what I said. Everybody, you know, I'm, I'm a Springfield outsider. You know, I'm running, I'm, I got into the race, and I've been quoted all over the place because in one of my speeches, and now I put it in there, I said, I got in the race because I'm fed up, you know, as a, just as a citizen, I was just fed up of sending my hard-earned tax dollars to Springfield, to the politicians in Springfield. I have nothing against the community of Springfield, but sending my dollars down you here. just say the politicians from across the state, because most of them are not from Springfield. You're absolutely right. And they don't stay here very long when they go. You're right. So, yeah. <laughs> so, but. Clarify a bit. But, but sending it to the Illinois state government. There you go. And sending, sending my tax dollars. And not getting my money's worth. I mean, that's that's how I became a frustrated citizen, and that's why I started helping people in political races who I believe had the same kind of fiscal thoughts that I have and kind of believe how I did. And and that's that's where I'm at, you know. And as I said, sometimes the decisions are hard to make when you're tied into the system for as long as you are, and you have all the special interests talking in your ears and telling you what to do. 
it's hard to say no to them. You know, it's, everybody's been able to say no to me on campaign contributions, so it's been nice from my standpoint that I'm not beholden to these people. I, I don't have a, a whole list of favors that I have to repay every time I get elected. I haven't been elected, and, you know, my goal of running for Secretary of State is not to figure out what's my, you know, what's my next re-election and what's my next office that I'm going to. Mine is I'm a 54-year-old attorney who's been practicing in Illinois. I love my state of Illinois, and I'm just I'm frustrated with what's going on. And if, if people from the outside, like me, don't get involved and we let the career politicians, Republicans and Democrats, continue to get a free pass and get reelected year after year, and we're, we're going to get the same thing that we've had. It's time for, you know, my, my, my slogan on my website, it's time for a clean break. we got to, at some point in time, we have to make the break. I think this is the year. And that's, that's who I am, you know. And, and if people in Illinois don't like me for that, and that's the statement I'm making, that's, that's, that's who I am, and that's what we're going to try to do. I mean, this is, it, it's, it's time for tough decisions to be made, you know, and we have to cut. You know, you have to look at every expense. I mean, whether it's school, you know, whether it's state, you know, secretary of state police, whether it's the secretary of state library duties, whether it's, you know, incorporation fees, whether it, you know, whatever it is, everything's got to be on the table because we can't sustain what we're doing. Are there any other uh, driving initiatives that you would like to see uh, adopted in the state and that you would push for? I would like to work, I would like to continue and enhance the truck driving safety because I think the, the, the use of our roads by the big rigs is still an area of, of major concern, the safety issue on our roads. And that's why I said with my daughters, I, you know, I let them take the keys and drive on the highways. It scares me. How do you enforce something, though, like the driving time issue, where so many of these accidents we see, you guys have been driving for 25, 26, 27 hours, and without, you know, stopping for appropriate sleep or whatever. Well, well we need to, we need. With their company, absolutely. You know, we need to enforce that, and there there is a balance. I mean, I'm I'm all for less regulation and let businesses do business in Illinois, but you got to be a good citizen too. It's a it's a two way street. The businesses are asking us to you know let us operate here in your state, let us use your roads in your state, let us do that. We can't just give away the store to them. We say, okay, we will do that, but here's the set of rules that you do have to follow. You have to be a good corporate citizen as well, and. We need, to, we need to support law enforcement. I, I had a, a state police officer who had an event talk to me about it, and he said, Mike, I do pull the guy over. Two things. I get grief from superiors saying, I'm depriving this driver of his livelihood when I pull him over and I cite him for driving too many hours. And then I kind of get you know, the pressure on me. So he goes, so I just quit enforcing it. I just quit pulling him over because I, it, it's it, right. So we need, we need to re-educate the system here, too. What's, what's the ultimate goal? If the ultimate goal is to pull the driver over so we can write them a ticket, or they have to go to court and we can find the company to raise revenue, let's just say that's what we're doing. We're doing it as a revenue raiser, and that's, we don't care about road safety. But let's, you know, let's, let's call it what it is. But I think we need to enforce the road safety issue. You know, if our roads were perfectly safe and you want to make raise revenues, you know, that's... I don't agree with it, but that's fine. But we're, we're hiding road safety behind, you know, yeah, revenue like generation. Back of those trucks that say, you know, here's a here's a toll free number. How am I driving? Mm -hmm. A load gauge that says how long I've been driving, and you're driving behind me. And here's a number to call if it looks more than the. Come on, my my cell phone. My car tells me that my car calls the car dealership to tell them that I need an oil change. You mean the truck can't say it's been running for 13 hours, turn off the ignition? You know, I don't know. I mean, there, yeah, there's got to be saying, something we can you know, where's, do. Where's the corporate conscience? There is none. You know, right now. You know, I mean, we, that's why I said we need good corporate citizens as well. And we need, to, we need to enforce those rules. And, yes, does it deprive somebody of their livelihood? I don't think, you know, 14 hours, 18 hours driving, they're depriving themselves and they're putting me at risk. So let's let's... You know, we, and we have to level the playing field because there's a lot of people following the rules, and somehow they're they're making a living doing it. So let's let's 
let's you know let's enforce what's on the books. I, I don't want to see any more laws and regulations and things. Let's 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 enforce what we have, and I think we can make it safer. Are you on term limits? All for them. Um, I've term I've term limited myself. I sent out a press release a couple weeks ago. Said, you know what, two terms in the Secretary of State's office. That's all I want. I'll I'll say that right from the get go, and I won't retract that four years from now or eight years from now. Saying one more term, my my tour duty's not over. Um, I won't I won't say those, those words are not mine. I. Um, in, in theory, I wish we didn't have to, to enforce term limit laws because the electorate should term limit people who aren't doing it. We've w manipulated the, the maps in Illinois in such a way, both parties have done that when they're in control, that we, we do need, I think we need to enforce term. It's good enough for our president, and I think it could be, it's good enough for our state offices as well. Are you an organ donor? I am an organ donor. I hope not to do that for a long time, but I'm signed up as an organ donor. Don't want to donate yeah, I am. No, no time soon, I hope. Is that a program that you would continue to? Absolutely. I, I think I think that's a great program. I mean, I, I think it's a, you know, the Secretary of State's office is a great, you know, office to be spearheading that just because of its interaction with, you know, with the motorists and with, with most of the residents of Illinois. You know, unfortunately, on an annual basis, I don't know if we need. You know, Arizona, you can get a lifetime driver's license. You know, in Illinois, we have to renew it four years. You know why? So we can raise revenue. Um, you know, there's some things we can do. Let's. You know, if it's a revenue raiser, let's just say it's a revenue raiser. But you know, fees, user fees, are the most regressive form of taxation we have. And in Illinois, and especially the Secretary of State's office, has gone crazy on applying and raising the user fees. Not that the, the way we use. Like, gas tax, road fund, these things are not controlled by the Secretary of State, but what is your feeling on proposals that are out there to either retool the way that the road fund is, monies that are in there are allocated, or other capital, you know, in lieu of having a capital program to build roads? I think, as I, as I said, everything's got to be on the table, and we've got to make the hard decisions, because that's exactly right. You know what, when the people doling out the money are tied to those people because they're their campaign donors, they're their constituents, you know, that aren't their voting constituents, but they're, you know, they're the special interest that they're beholden to, we're, we're not going to get it done. So what we need to do is we, we need to rattle the cage a little bit and say, this is, you know what, this is what we need for roads. These are the dollars we need for roads. This is what comes in for the gas tax or the motor fuel service tax or whatever revenue source there. are. And this is what we need, you know. Well, here's all we got, you know. So make do with what we've got and let's next year try to figure that out and next year try to figure that out. Let's actually have a budget. Let's actually balance the budget in Illinois. Wouldn't that be a, something interesting to try to do, you know. Yeah, I know. You know, I mean, well, our country doesn't know how to do it either. And, you know, and they come to the federal level. You know, you can't, I know, I don't know we can't do it overnight, but we got to start moving in the direction to do that because we're, we're actually moving further away from balancing our budget than we are to doing it. And so we have to allocate that. I mean, my school district, we, we wanted everything. You know, I mean, and the, the administration wanted everything, the teachers wanted everything, and we have a beautiful schools. But you know what? There wasn't enough money, and when we went and asked the people who were supporting those schools, we want more money because we want everything, they said, what you've got right now is fine. You know, we don't need fancier schools or better athletic fields. The, the fields you have now are, are fine. Use the money you've got. And that's the state of Illinois. I think that's what the taxpayers are telling people in Illinois. I've given you enough. Use the money you got. $35 million, billion. I mean, we have a pretty big budget here in Illinois. I mean, we, we should be able to provide it. And the services we're providing, you know, I mean, and this is legislative. Now I'm going to get on my, soap, my political soapbox here. You know, I mean, our, our funding for the developmentally disabled, I mean, it's not a Secretary of State issue, but it, it's, it's sad, you know, and, and, and our funding to schools, it's sad. You know, as I said, for where I live, I'm fortunate, you know, we're in, you know, the, they, every, every time they refer to the DuPage County Schools, they throw the word affluent in front of it, the affluent DuPage County Schools. You know, you know I mean, I, I live there, I live there by choice. I grew up in Joliet that doesn't have affluent schools, you know, in some of the areas. You know, and I live in an area that, you know, my kids, we do. 
but I pay high property taxes too. But you know, there, there's a limit, and people will say, you know, I mean, I have a lot of my neighbors who say I can't afford to live here anymore because of the school taxes. So the option is to move away. There's people saying I can't afford to live in Illinois because of the income taxes and the user fees. So what's their option? They're moving away. You know, that, that's a very local issue because it affects so many people so differently. My school district's very small, and when you said the funding coming from the state earlier, Tobias, that we get, we get slightly over $500,000 from the state of Illinois in our school, in our $13 million budget. So it's a big number. $500,000 is a big number, but in percentage to our budget, it's not. We will lose 90% of that $500,000. And 90% of that... So about $450,000 loss to my school district at an average teacher, new teacher salary, benefits and everything, that's about seven to eight teachers that we would lose. We only have 77 teachers. So we'd lose 10% of our programming because of that change. So I think before they just quit, write and sign this law, it's, it's not, they didn't create anything and they didn't add any money to the school pot. All they're doing is reallocating the money. So. You know, they're, more they're well to make it more equitable. Yeah, but but I don't think it's making it more. You know, my personal opinion. I'm not sure it's equitable yet because I, I haven't read the whole law, but I've read a lot of the stuff that's on it from my school board. But I'm getting it from my my school district standpoint. You know, and, and looking at that. Yes, I think school needs to be equitable. But it, it's it, we do this so many times in Illinois. Okay, we're going to do this, so that's going to make it more equitable. Well, you tweak this one piece without looking at the whole system, it doesn't work. You know, I'm a tax lawyer. I've watched the IRS do this forever. Oh, we're going to close this loophole. So, we're going to, you know, we're going to shut this door. All they did was open another one or, you know, they you know, this this happened. So, by by, you know, Senate Bill 16 doing that, yeah, it's closed and trying to make things more equitable. But they're not looking at, you know, my school district where we're going to lose, you know, that that big a piece. No. They are looking at yeah. all the school districts, but is there something to be said for if you make all the districts more equitable, you you potentially can draw more businesses to Illinois across the state. You can boost the economy. I mean, you're you're very much into taxes, the mm -hmm. um, business or pro business yes. growth um, standpoint. I mean, is is there something to be said if you if you make this more equitable across the state, Illinois becomes more attractive? Perhaps well, better better schools, absolutely, absolutely better schools would make us more attractive, you know. And but but to to add to one, you know, it, I don't I don't like to see it as a zero sum game. I don't want to take it away from one side, make make them a lower performing school to make somebody a higher performing. I mean, that's that's not a win in my book. I think what we have to do is move everybody up. It's not it's not bring the the higher you know more spending higher schools down. As much as it is bringing the other schools up, I think we need to we need to lift everybody up, but not not to the detriment. Yeah. Well, I, I, we just have by doing the reverse of what you just said. The problem occurred because of the way the, 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 there's no there's no need uh, qualification for the state money. No. You don't have to need it. No. Right. And that's what I think what. The, the bill, as I understand, Senate Bill 16 is about equity based right. on needs. Right. Well, and, and I think, to, you know, uh, let's just take a look at the numbers for a second. I, I, I agree. Outcome to that change. Right. And, and I agree. I mean, in school, we, we, we have to, if we're going to put a priority on school, we have to figure out where the money's coming from. You know, I mean, school, developmentally disabled, I think some other areas in the state, we need, we need to allocate it. And the first thing we can't do is pay. You know, as much the interest expenses we're paying, and as much into you know our pension debt as we're paying. So we got it. Unless we fix those problems, we we don't have enough money to to fix schools. We don't have enough money to do it. So Senate Bill 16 is not fixing schools right now. It's kind of it's disguising a problem that we have. You know, it might it might help some lower performing schools. And you know what? My personal opinion, and I've had this argument with my superintendent, our school district, the one I'm on, will survive. You know, we'll figure it out. You know, we're, we will we will cut programs. So we did it before. We can do it again. Um, you know, we we don't have a requirement of transporting our children to and from schools with buses. So what we did, we we bought some buses with some of our money, and we charged people to ride the bus. We'll just get rid of the buses. You know, we parents will have to drive their kids to school. 
You know, we, we cut out buses in my school district after I got on the board, and we reduced our school day from 10 periods to eight periods, and we cut the class sizes down. Not one parent came to a school board meeting to say, my kid's not getting math and science the way they used to get it, that you've cut it out. But we had a room full of people say, you cut out the school buses. You know, so, you know, we, we need to educate everybody too. And that's what happens in, with the Springfield politicians, the people from around the state that come to Springfield as politicians. They're, you know, they're, they're missing the forest to the trees. You know, we've, we've got to, you know, the, and, and you can't just solve, you know, one little piece of the problem and say this is going to fix something because, you know, it, it opens a tidal wave. My school district will be fine. But I can't say that for, I mean, I have a neighboring school district that has, you know, 85% of their children in that school district are free and reduced lunches. So they don't collect fees from them. They have, you know, an issue. But they also have one of the most wealthiest property tax bases because, the, the wealthy people in part of the city is kind of bifurcated and they've got some industrial that the, the higher earners are sending all their kids to private school because they're not sending them to the public schools. So it, excuse for them to, for, yeah, so and for them to lose that percentage would, would be detrimental to, to that school district. And, and we're, we're three miles apart. You know, you know, our borders, you know, I mean, we, we border with them I and mean, their district office and ours. We're, you know, everybody kind of lumps us together. We all feed into the same high school. They all think, oh, these districts are all the same. We are, we're so different, just in that close together. So what, we'll be fine? I don't think they will be. We didn't mean to take you off the uh, Secretary of State now, but I, I am often curious what people, especially you being a yeah. school board in one of the suburbs. Well, when I, you know what, this is, this is who I am though on the campaign trail. I mean, I think if people get to know who I am, they'll see what I could do if I was the Secretary of State. And that's what I'm trying to tell people. You know, I'm not, I, I don't have the, the great political answers. You know, the, I don't have the, the rhetoric. And, you know, I've been criticized sometimes. Say, well, no, come on, get to the point. What's the, you know, what would you do if, you know, five points of the, you know, change the Secretary of State? I'm not going to sling any mud at the prior Secretary of State from a standpoint. And you know, my grandpa used to give phrases all the time, quotes, and I remembered them. I know he didn't make any of them up, but, you know, he used to say, if you sling dirt, all you're doing is losing ground, you know. So I'm, you know, I don't have anything, you know, to, you know, I, that's that's not what I'm about. You know, what's what's happened behind me is behind me. Let's, what are we going to do tomorrow? And same with the school problem, the pension problem, you know, all our state fiscal problems. Let's, you know, let's draw the line and let's now, now let's go forward. You know, let, how do we get more businesses to come to Illinois? How do we preserve the tax base? How do we how do we keep people from moving out? You know, if they were moving to sunny Florida or the West Coast beaches or something. I don't understand why people are leaving, but they're going to Wisconsin and Michigan and Indiana. You know, they're not they're not leaving Illinois for for beautiful places. They're leaving for this, of the political environment in Illinois. What does it pro You might have a unique position in being a, you know pro business. Want to attract new businesses, businesses like Uber and Lyft. Mm -hmm. Exciting, but I mean, how do you feel about what's going on with them? Again, I'll go back to everybody's got to be a good corporate citizen. And I, I always feel, now, now this is not Secretary of State again, this is just figure out who I am. You know, a lot of times when regulations get put on the books, they were there to protect somebody else. A lot of times it's an existing business. And, you know, we've, we've watched, watched a lot of things change. I mean, I used to rent the video at the little mom and pop video store by my house and we'd stop after church on Saturday night and get a video and that was family fun. Then the next thing you know that little video store went out because, because the blockbusters moved into our neighborhood and then we all went to the big store to do that. Now they're gone and we all get it on Netflix. You know things change. You know if we put a regulation in my community that said you couldn't have a big video store we'd still have all the ma and pa little video stars, but is that the right thing to do? Same thing, you know, I, I don't, I've not looked into the Uber and the taxi cab issues other than what I read in the paper, or probably in your paper, you know. There, there's, you know, there needs to be an evolution. It appears in that industry. I hate riding in cabs. I don't know how you guys feel. I mean, I, I, every time I get in a cab in a big city, I feel like I'm getting ripped off. I don't, I don't know. You know, Washington, D.C. is only, the only one that I can almost kind of figure out because they have a little grid. And they say, if you move from this zone to this zone, it's going to cost you this much. So I kind of have an idea. I mean, I, I went to school in Chicago and worked there for four years. So seven years I spent in Chicago. I got in a cab every time. I was always hoping I had enough money. 
because I didn't know how much it was going to cost me to get from point A to point B. And I could take the same cab ride five different times and it would be five different prices. So th th maybe that industry needs to change. I don't, I don't understand it, haven't really looked into it, but, but I don't want to put regulations out there to stop somebody new. You know, I think we need to, you know, I think we need to shrink with what we're doing in government instead of over-regulating everybody. So you know we're fiscally or conservative? Very conservative. What about social issues? I'm pretty conservative in that area as well. What is your productive rights? Well, as a father of four daughters, I have you know personal concerns. I mean, I'm a I'm a pro-life person. Um, you know, I've raised I'm raised Roman Catholic. Went to Catholic had a Catholic education. I've kind of that's how I feel. Um, but that's also coming from a male. You know, so you know I don't I haven't had to face the issue with my daughters or you know and what I would do. But I I don't believe it's my decision. You know, I don't believe it's the politician's decision to make. And somebody's, somebody's like same-sex marriage. Um, I'm again my Roman Catholic background. I'm I'm a traditional marriage person, but just as much as I want the government out of my my boardroom, I want them out of my bedroom too. Get out of the house. This isn't this isn't really where where we need to waste our energy and on the government standpoint. You know, I like people to be happy. I have you know friends who are you know same-sex couples, and you know as long as you're happy, that's great. But it's it's not. You know, it's not really where I've been raised and educated and would believe in. And who are you voting for for governor? Bruce Reiner. Okay. And why, what, what appeals to you about, other than you're a Republican, I mean, like... Because I actually, I've, I've liked Bruce for a long time. Um, he kind of reminds me of me. Um, he probably says I remember, you know. I, 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 think he looks, I think he looks up to me. No, um, <laughs> as I said, I said earlier in... Uh, yeah. That's right. <laughs> Yeah, so he's got me on height, but on the other issues, I think he looks. No, Bruce. Bruce is is the outsider as well. You know, from I mean, he might be more inside. You know, from that he's been in the game a lot longer from a as a donor standpoint to people. And um, but I think Illinois needs some people who can readily come in and make some hard decisions. You know, somebody who's not been embedded in in the Springfield politics for the last 20, 30, 40 years of their life. I mean, somebody to come in. And you know what? Tell people. I know you don't want to hear this, but this is what we got to do. And and you know, I like I like the businessman. I like the non-political insider. And that's you know, Bruce has had my support for a long time. All right. Do you have any other questions? Mm -hmm. Is there anything you'd like to say that we haven't covered, or anything? That you no, I just pre I appreciate the opportunity. You guys have me down here. As I said, that's. Uh, you know, when I, people will ask me why, why I would want to run against Jesse White, I always say, well, I really don't want to run against Jesse White. You know, I mean, I wish, I wish he would have lived up to his promise and said that this was his last term. I'm going to try to make it his last term. Um, but just because, you know, you've been in that office for a long time and you're politically beloved in the state does not mean you're immune from a challenge. And politically beloved and closely examined could be two different things. So let's let's open up the books and say what can we do what can we do going forward? And that's that's who I am. <laughs>